In today's True Crime tutorial Tuesday video, I'm talking about Leslie Molseed whilst doing my makeup, so keep on watching to hear about her murder and to see me create this makeup look. Leslie Molseed was a small, frail little girl. She suffered from a congenital heart condition which affected her health and development, both physically and mentally. At the time this case took place, Leslie was 11 years old, however she had the mental age of a four-year-old. At lunchtime on the 5th of October 1975, Leslie Molseed left her home on the Turf Hill Estate in Rochdale to get a few bits from the shop for her mother. She never came home. When she didn't come home, her mother began to panic and sent out a search party to find the little girl. There was no sign of her and worse, no evidence that she even made it to the shop. The police were called and began an enormous search around the town of Rochdale and the adjacent M62 area. Finally, three days later, Leslie's body was found on a lay-by of a motorway near Rishworth Moor. She was lying face down and had been stabbed 12 times in the upper shoulders and back. None of her clothes were disturbed and there were no signs that she had put up any sort of fight. As far as evidence went, forensics collected foreign fibres, traces of wallpaper paste and 379 other small objects from the body in the surrounding area. The most important bit of evidence, however, was semen that was found on her body. This bit of evidence would be the paramount factor in sending two men to prison, one guilty and one not. Stephen Crisco was a local tax clerk with moderate mental health problems. At the time of the hunt, four teenage girls, Maxine Buckley, Pamela Hind, Catherine Burke and Debbie Brown came forward and accused Stephen of indecently exposing himself to the girls the day before the murder. According to West Yorkshire Police, this was enough evidence to arrest Stephen and they conveniently decided he was the sort of person who would fit the profile of the person likely to kill Leslie. The police chose to ignore that Stephen had the mental age of a seven-year-old and a clean slate with the law. Acting upon the girls' accusations, Stephen's recluseness and the fact that they found sweets and softcore porn in the back of his car, the police arrested him on the 21st of December 1975. After three days of intensive questioning, Stephen confessed to the crime. Believing that the investigators would prove his confession false, making him innocent and sending him home. He did not have a lawyer present and he was never asked if he wanted one. His requests for his mother to be present were repeatedly denied. A false confession is an admission of guilt for a crime for which the confessor is not responsible and they can happen for a number of reasons. One of these is some sort of mental disorder that makes the suspect actually believe they did it and another is in order to protect someone else. False confessions can also occur through coercion when a suspect is pressured or blackmailed into giving a confession so the police can quickly close the case with a conviction and wash their hands of it. These usually take place after hours of relentless questioning without rest or aid from anyone else and they are usually focused on vulnerable people who are easy to crack. It would be accurate to suggest that Stephen's confession was coerced. After confessing to the police, Stephen was charged with Leslie Morsey's murder on the Christmas Eve of 1975. He was sentenced to life in prison in July 1976 at Leeds Crown Court. Stephen, who was sent to the sex offenders wing, was taunted and abused by other inmates. His mental health deteriorated drastically and every appeal was dismissed. During his 17 years in prison, Stephen developed schizophrenia and began to suffer from various delusions. Meanwhile, his mother never gave up on the hope of setting him free and in 1984 she contacted the human rights organisation Justice who put her in contact with solicitor Campbell Malone who took on Stephen's case. The case was reopened in 1991 and Miller and his team found a catalogue of mistakes and inconsistencies as they began to investigate further. The most overwhelming piece of evidence was that the semen left on Leslie's body could not belong to Stephen due to an illness which rendered him infertile and impotent. Plus, there was an eyewitness that placed him elsewhere at the time of the murder. And remember those four girls that said Stephen had flashed at them? Well, this was going on. They all came forward and said they made it up for a laugh. The worst part is only one of them, Pamela Hind, apologised for what they did to such an innocent and vulnerable man. I personally think they should have got some sort of... Um, 
like punishment for this because they've literally ruined someone's life by making up a false accusation and it really annoys me because then when you know it does happen to someone people doubt them his case was taken back to court in 1992 17 years after he was first taken into custody and his name was finally cleared. This case has been dubbed the worst miscarriage of justice of all time and spurred a full and wide ranging inquiry into the conviction. Unfortunately, prison had taken a serious toll of Stephen's psyche. After his release, he was committed to Presswich Hospital where he received treatment for his illness. In April 1992, he was allowed home, but the years of incarceration had destroyed him and he lost interest in everything and rarely left his home. Stephen tragically died from a heart attack in October 1993. Which is such a shame because obviously he was finally out of prison and it would have been nice for him to have been able to sort of enjoy the rest of his life. And if the police had just done the job properly in the first place and actually investigated the case, then they would have found the murderer and not locked an innocent man away. And this also meant that the actual killer was able to, you know, go out, commit more crimes. I really think that they shouldn't have even been allowed to convict Stephen with the lack of evidence and everything but obviously they did. With the release of Stephen in 1992, the case remained cold and for 14 years, nobody heard so much as a whisper from the police with regards to Leslie's murder. That was until November 2006, when West Yorkshire police arrested a comic book dealer, Ronald Castry, in connection to the murder. In what must have been seen by the police as a pure stroke of luck, Ronald was arrested in connection with an unrelated sex crime, whereupon a DNA sample was then found to match the semen sample that was left on the body of Leslie Molseed 31 years prior. Donald, I'm uh, DC1762 Jeff Dunn from West Yorkshire Police. Yeah. Um, I'll just warn you now that um, everything that we say is being tape recorded. I'm not going to hide it, just dying on. Right. What's going on? Are you Ronald Charles Edward Castro? I am. Right, listen very carefully okay. to what I've got to say to you now. You were under arrest for the murder of Leslie Susan Molseed. You're joking. Between 12 noon on Sunday, the 5th of October 1975 and 4.6.45am on Wednesday, the 8th of October 1975. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention, when questioned, something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand the caution? Yes, I understand the caution. Your arrest is necessary for the prompt and effective investigation of the offence. Right. Okay, you're going to be taken from here to Halifax Police Station now. It's ridiculous. I was threatened with this donkey years ago. I have no knowledge, and I've certainly never, never met this dead girl or any member of her family. <coughs> I have no knowledge as to how you, you come to, say, a sample of my DNA is found at that place, especially after 30 years. So for 31 years, this man was thinking he got away with the murder of Leslie, and finally he was caught and brought to justice. With the accuracy of one in a billion, this piece of shit was found guilty in 2007 and was sentenced to life in prison. Lunchtime on October the 5th, 1975, and Leslie Molseed set off on the short journey to the local shop to buy a loaf of bread and an air freshener. But the 11-year-old schoolgirl never returned. As she left her home on Delamere Road in Rochdale, her mother would never have imagined it was the last time she'd see her daughter alive. Three days later, on October the 8th, Leslie's body was found on the moors near Rippenden in West Yorkshire. She'd been stabbed 12 times. Police launched a major investigation with 260 detectives working on the case. They interviewed nearly 12,000 people, checked 10,000 vehicles and visited around 1,000 houses. And then a breakthrough. 
Two days before Christmas that year, Stefan Kishko, a tax clerk from Rochdale, was charged with her murder. The following July, Kishko was jailed for life after a jury found him guilty of murder on a majority verdict of 10 to 2. And then, after Kishko had spent 16 years in prison, the whole case against him unravelled. In 1992, his conviction was quashed and he was released from jail. Forensic evidence had been re-examined and it indicated that he couldn't have been responsible for the murder. So if it wasn't Kishko, who had killed Leslie Molseed? In 2000, there was a new breakthrough. Modern forensic techniques allowed police to put together a DNA profile of the killer. The case was relaunched and a new incident room was set up with a small team. They followed up new leads and looked at information from the original inquiry. Then, in November 2006, police arrested Ronald Castry, a 54-year-old comic book dealer from Oldham. They had matched up the DNA from the scene with his DNA on their database. The very next day, he was charged with Leslie's murder. The murder of Leslie Rollseed affected the lives of more than just her family and friends. This case fell victim to a string of corrupt police, incompetent lawyers, scapegoating and the terrible treatment of mental health in a way that dragged out the trauma for nearly three decades. The death of this little girl and the treatment and subsequent death of Stephen Kiska will long be remembered, especially as a distinct black mark on the justice system in the country as a whole. Years of uncertainty and a long wait for justice have finally come to an end for the family of Leslie Molseed. A jury at Bradford Crown Court found Ronald Castry, a 54-year-old comic book dealer from Oldham, guilty of Leslie's murder. As the judge, Mr Justice Openshaw, sentenced Castry to life in prison, he said it would be at least 30 years before Castry is even considered for parole. As the jury gave its verdict, there were shouts of yes and tears of relief from the public gallery, where Leslie's mother, April, was sitting surrounded by her family. We are relieved that after so long, our quest for justice for Leslie is now over. It has been a long and harrowing ordeal, and our gratitude to the friends, family and strangers throughout the world who have given us their support is immense. This is a proud day for West Yorkshire Police too. We could never turn the clock back, but what we could do was try and put things right. And I'm proud to have led an excellent team of detectives who've done that today and achieved justice, brought Leslie's killer to justice. The jury took more than two days to reach a verdict, and even then the judge had to accept a majority of 10 to 2. The judge then said to Castro, you carried on with your life as though nothing had happened. Today, though, your past has caught up with you. Castri continued to protest his innocence even as he was led away, saying, but I didn't do it. There was plenty of emotion in the courtroom behind me this afternoon, but after all, this was the conclusion of a case that's taken more than three decades to solve. So guys, that is everything I have for this case, everything for today's video. I hope you guys have all enjoyed and I will see you all in the next one.